again to this week's virtual shadowing session. Uh, this week's topic is going to be the introduction to the physician-patient interactions and how to assess, diagnose, and treat. Uh, feel free to follow us on Instagram at virtual shadowing. We also have a YouTube account, Free Health Virtual Shadowing. And visit us on our website at uh, www.virtualshadowing.com uh, for more information about the program. Uh, okay, and then so we have our upcoming topic. So next, we're going to be going over a day in the life of the emergency medicine physician. That's going to be on June 23rd. Uh, and so that will be actually hosted um, by Dr. Fowler as well. Um, and so the next week after that, we have a, a topic is going to be over COVID disease and how we're managing it, what is it and what we can do about it. And that's going to be on June 30th. Then we got the introduction to disaster medicine on July 7th, and then further sessions will be announced later. Okay, and so this is our team again. Uh, this is the working group for the virtual shadowing program. We have Reagan, who is uh, not here with us tonight. Um, we have me, Cheyenne, and then we have Taylor, Alana, Rachel, Aniruth, Mariam, and Anthony, uh, who is not here with us today. And then we also have Dr. Raymond Fowler. Uh, he is the chief of the Division of Emergency Medicine Medical Services at UT Southwestern. He's the James M. Atkins uh, MD Professor of Emergency Medical Services, and he uh, is ready to take the rest of this session away. <laughs> and uh, feel free to type your questions in the chat as well as we go. So if you have any questions, type it in the chat, and then we're going to pick and choose which ones we're able to answer. We're going to have a mini question and answer session uh, in between. Um, in the middle of this session as well, and at the end. So we're all ready. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. It's so nice to see you. My name is Ray Fowler. I'm an emergency doc. I've been doing this for 42 years. I serve on the admissions committee at UT Southwestern Medical Center, where I've been working there for almost a decade, uh, uh, looking at folks, 5,000 applicants a year, people like you. We know why you're here. We know that you're having a very difficult time finding shadowing time, and that the demonstration of having found, found or trying to find shadowing time is an important effort by medical students. We want to help you. This is why we came together with this marvelous working group of pre-med kids um, to be able to see if we can help you find what you need to move on in your medical career. In the first week, we tried to talk you out of it. In the second week, we talked to you about, well, if you're still here, about how to apply to it. And since 400 of you just showed up, then now let's talk about how to do it. This is a very difficult time. I started medicine almost a half century ago, and I have watched astonishing things occur. I saw what happened in the early 1980s, where I was in the emergency department in a suburban hospital in near Atlanta, Georgia, my hometown where I went home to practice medicine in my hometown and suddenly young adult males were beginning to show up in respiratory distress, cyanotic, very short of breath, just de desperately, deathly ill. And we didn't know what it was. And then presently, finally, the human T cell lymphotropic virus type three was isolated, later to be named hum human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's played such an important role that we'll talk more about in the COVID thing in a couple of weeks, has played, he played an important role in the working out of HIV, and it was a terrifying time. It was a horrible epidemic. Um, and that very much changed life as we know it. Uh, we'll talk about this more in two weeks. Please come. This COVID thing is very, very interesting, and you should be watching it because you are an incoming medical person. There's a word I want you to look up. It's not epidemic. It's endemic. E-N-D-E-M-I-C, I want you to look it up. I think COVID may be coming endemic, and we'll talk about that more in about two weeks. Coincidence, coincident with this awful epidemic, in which now 117,000 Americans alone have died, now in not even four months. More people have died in America in four months than have um, died from the Vietnam War, uh, everyone put yourself on mute, please, um, than have died in the Vietnam War or in the Korean War put together from the United States of America. It's a very difficult time. Um, and in the midst of all this, we've had this necessary, you could argue, but violent recognition of 
people wanting to express their rights as Americans. It's important that you study American history because how this marvelous country was born some 250 years ago was a marvelous study in making it up as they went, but it was in the rights of humans. You entering the medical profession must become an advocate for the right of people. That is what you do, that is who you are. I'm not some bleeding liberal person, I'm a conservative person by and large who grew up in the segregation era in the sunny South back in the 1950s and watched desegregation occur. So I came from the background of some of the slides that you're gonna see here, which is the issue of intrinsic bias something that we have to fight. What is it? You might say it's a pre-learned subconscious stereotype and it affects the way we make decisions. And interestingly, this is the point, <clears throat> it's really not a voluntary choice, it's involuntary. Most of us really don't realize that we have these biases. We're unaware of them and that these things have an enormous impact on the way you function. I saw a, pa a patient recently, he was an old guy, he was really sick, just lots of old chronic diseases. And uh, you know, he was an indigent fellow, God bless him, he was just terribly sick. And I was putting him in the hospital. <clears throat> and I was, as I was going to put him in the hospital, uh, we are now testing everyone for COVID before they go in the hospital. And I said, fine, we're just gonna put a little swab in there and check you. And the man absolutely refused. And there I was about seven hours into an eight hour shift. I'm 67 years old, I'm tired. <clears throat> I'm an old redneck from the woods. And I got a little angry. I said, who does he think he is? I mean, he's here, we're taking care of him. All we're wanting to do is swab his nose. You know, why can't he just cooperate? It was an intrinsic bias on my part, I fully confess it. I don't know what was in that man's heart about why he didn't want to be tested. It probably had nothing to do with the swab. He's had far more worse things happen to him than a swab in his nose. But I found right in the middle of my own heart and my own ER, the fact that this stuff was welling up in my heart. And folks, we have to be very, very careful with this. I want to assure you that for those of us on medical school committees, we are trained extensively on how to avoid intrinsic bias when we meet our prospective students. <clears throat> so how does it happen that we get this bias? That, because it's, we, we become socialized at an early age and process this stuff based upon the messages that we receive and experience, which can be quite direct or quite subtle. The media and the news also play a big role in programming us and to significantly shape our minds. <clears throat> but the intrinsic biases are pervasive. They are everywhere. We all have them. They don't always align with our declared beliefs or even reflect the stances that we would support. This is why I'm bringing this up in a lecture where we're talking about examining the patient, is that you must fight back the issues of intrinsic bias because it can happen in patient care and it can cloud your judgment. You must not do that. It affects how you interact with the patients, how you communicate, how you treat them, or even the options for pain control. I had a patient a day or two ago who <clears throat> came in with metastatic cancer who was in profound, horrible pain because of a collapsed spine. <clears throat> and, and yet he seemed a little bit odd. And I was saying, well, maybe he's really not having all the pain that he thinks he has. Maybe he's just a narcotics dependent person. That's an intrinsic bias and you have to fight that. You have to look at the whole patient to see why a man with metastatic prostate cancer that spread to his bones and his spine is collapsed, <clears throat> that why in the world, excuse me, <clears throat> why in the world he might have, an, that, that you know we might have an intrinsic bias, but in fact, this man was in fact in horrible pain. How does it work? Well, non-white patients can get fewer uh, cardiovascular diagnoses. Black women are more likely to die of breast cancer. Non-white patients are less likely to get pain meds, like I was talking about. Patients of color are more likely to be blamed for being passive about their health care. Black men are less likely to receive chemo for prostate cancer and actually more likely to have an orchiectomy, testicles removed, <clears throat> for cancer. These are these odd things that show up in medicine at times when we should be looking at the whole patient. <clears throat> Can we try to control or reduce our intrinsic biases? You bet. We certainly can do that. How do you do it? 
We must be motivated to minimize the impact that these biases have on healthcare delivery so that we can employ a perspective taking the cognitive component of empathy where we enter in. Dr. Fowler? Yes. Please. I think that there are some people who are in the waiting room apparently that they're saying. Well, then why don't we do this? Uh, everyone, uh, take I a I just want to make sure we can let everyone in. Uh, let's see. What am I? Let's see. What am I not doing here? Let's see here. Um, Taylor, um, what do I need to do to. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have more in the waiting room to say, huh? Uh, I, I see 405. Do you think there are more out there? Uh, how about there's there are 51 ways? I want to keep That's us right. going. I just want to make sure. No, no, no. That's absolutely it. great. With this. Oh, I'm so sorry. We're going to hit 500 tonight. Isn't that wonderful? I apologize for all of you. This is my own fault. <clears throat> for we now have eight, seven, six, five, four showing up. Keep me honest, Taylor. Um, speak up anytime. Um, I have no intrinsic bias toward the west part of Texas and Texas Tech. So. Uh, um, that was a joke, Tyler. You can, you know, uh, see two more waiting in that all. One more. Um, if you want, you can switch it to one of us and we can be the host to let people in. Uh, will that still let me do the sharing thing? I think so. Uh, how do I flip the host to you? Um, uh, just go to my name in like search my name and participants and then go to uh make host okay um y'all have to excuse me out there because i am still surprised that airplanes fly um uh, let's see rachel i've got to find you um let's see uh rachel there's hundreds in here and i'm having trouble finding you let's see uh oh, there you are so if i go to that i make you the host you're now the host Change host. Okay, we're done. So I can still do my slides and still screen share, right? You should be able to. Let, oh. I still see your screen. Well, we can host. <clears throat> so, okay, is that you're in charge now? You are the person. Um, yes. All right. So there we are. So what what can we do? We can take the perspective, folks. The thing about medicine is the empathy of those that we are there to serve. They are not here for us. We are here for them. We have to use our emotional regulation skills so we have, especially to exhibit positive emotions during patient encounters, to reframe our interactions with patients as a collaborative experience and to understand our patients' cultures. <clears throat> now, let's get into physical exams since we covered implicit bias. You're gonna become a doc, a PA, perhaps a nursing practitioner. There are going to be two types of patients that you're going to see. <clears throat> I'm speaking to you as a professor, attending physician to medical student and a, a pre-med student shadowing with me. So this is shadowing on how you examine patients now. You're gonna have two types of patients, the acutely ill and the non-acutely ill. They fall into two broad categories. For example, in the emergency department, someone comes in to see me because they typically have a problem. They may have multiple problems at the same time, but they typically have a thing that I'll talk about in a moment called the chief complaint. Then there is the other side of that, which is the non-emergent cases, such as, for example, if you're a fam family medicine physician, which is the bedrock infrastructure of medicine in our nation, you may have someone coming in for their annual physical. And what you're doing is, well, yes, do they have a complaint, but on the other hand, let's do the broad checkup of the broad review of systems and the broad physical that we'll talk about in just a moment. Emergent cases are medical care that directly deals with things that may be threats to an individual's life. I'm going to give you a couple of things that are relatively brand new. You're gonna hear in a minute about X, A, B, C. You should take some notes and write this down. Um, and I will talk to you some about my work with American Heart Association and, and stuff that we're training the public to recognize. Emergent cases are such things as a heart attack or a stroke or someone who drops dead with a cardiac arrest, gunshot wounds, severe trauma such as automobile accidents, poisonings, suicidal feelings and depression, uh, agitation and delirium. That's been playing a great deal of uh, emphasis, in the, emphasis in the news these days is agit agitation and that which has led to the protests in our nation. Someone with an abdominal pain that turns out it's an acute appendicitis or perhaps a rupturing ectopic pregnancy 
or a severe allergic reaction. As opposed to, say, a non-emergent type case, this might be someone who goes to see their physician in their office who is doing a routine physical, or is someone who might go see the physician in the office with a complaint that's new. You might say it's considered non-emergent if it's not life-threatening, but it, that it needs some timely care, such as a condition that likely won't deteriorate, but a condition that also could be unbearable due to discomfort. I'm telling you, the arthritis that old folks my age and above get can be unbearable. And, and folks, pain is an emergency, and you have to deal with that. Take people seriously. Don't show implicit bias. Take their word for it. I will treat pain always <clears throat> unless I find out that I'm being deceived in some way. Fractures tend to be a situation that unless there is a lacerated artery uh, or a severe angulation, they can wait a little bit. A laceration should be dealt with promptly. They can wait a little bit. <clears throat> flu typically is not terribly serious unless the patient is having acute, acute life-threatening problems, such as shortness of breath. Sore throat usually isn't too terribly horrible. A sprain is something not too terribly hor horrible, especially if they can bear weight or move the joint. Most insect bites, unless they get infected or cause an allergic reaction, these tend to be more non-emergent. <clears throat> now, folks, write this down. As you walk into the room to see a patient, also, parenthetically, when you're with your family, when you go to a scene at the church, or you go to a picnic, or you go to a place where there are a lot of people and something seems to be happening, look around you at the, look around you at the source of the issue to look for X, A, B, C. X is for external bleeding, spurting arterial bleeding specifically. <clears throat> so you have to look for bleeding. At the same time, you assess the status of the patient's airway. Are they able to move air sufficiently? Then what is the quality of their breathing? Do they seem to be breathing normally and relaxed, or do they have an elevated respiratory rate with an elevated work of breathing, or is the breathing seems to be quite uh, slow uh, and not moving very, very much at all? And then circulation. You, as you walk up to the patient, you assess circulation by looking at the patient, any obvious bleeding, you look at their skin color, are they pale or not? In patients of color, you look at the palm of their hands, at the inside of their mouth, at their tongue, at their conjunctiva to look for color. Capillary refill time, you should be able to press and the, re, uh, the capillary should refill the pad of the finger in less than two seconds. You can palpate the rate of the pulse. The pulse should be in an, an adult between 60 and 99, for example, to be considered normal. Also, at some point, you can listen to the heart, <clears throat> take a blood pressure, and at some point, if you have availability, to put them on an electrocardiography. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, at some point, you're going to begin to start talking to your patient. I know that's elementary. Just go with me on this for a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that defines you as a clinician is how you talk to a patient. This is very much tied into experience. One of the things you're going to see down the road is that you're going to be a med student or a PA student or a nursing practitioner student, and you're going to go into a room and take a history on a patient, and then the resident physician will come back and take another history and get a totally different history, and then the attending physician will come in and get a totally different history after that with a whole lot less work, and you'll go, wow, what did I not see? How do I do that? And the thing is, it's about experience. What you're going to be paying all this money for in school is book learning. What you cannot buy is experience. Now, I know it sounds like an old blue hair, gray hair with long hair, who says, yeah, in my experience, but I'm telling you that the only way you, you can't go to the store and say, I want five pounds of experience. You can't buy that. You have to get on the horse every day and ride patient after patient, day after day, shift after shift, and pay attention. You talk to the folks, you take a look at them, you order stuff, you do a differential, you treat them, and then you see what happens. That is how you learn in medicine. Here are the steps to taking a comprehensive history. We'll run through these very quickly. <clears throat> Firstly, you, you walk in and you be polite. You do not show implicit bias. Look the people in the eye. 
don't go straight to the computer and turn your back to the patient. Um, I will swear to you that one of the best investments I ever made in the top 10 investments of the things I ever made in my life was my typing class in high school. Uh, and then I played the piano. I can fly at the keyboard. I have very nimble fingers, thank goodness. So when the residents and students are talking to me, I can just about be a sonographer and type as they talk. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to worry about spending so much time at the computer. I can go back and sit down and be able to type up my notes pretty quickly. So look the patient in the eye. When the time comes that you can sit down, I sit on the edge of the bed. I, I do. Uh, I don't right now because of the COVID problem. And um, say, the look, I, I'm Dr. Fowler, and I'd just like to talk to you. Is that okay? And then if there's other folks in the room, say, can I speak with you in front of your friends and family here? Or <clears throat> would you like to have them uh, step out? And then find out why they're here. The title of that is called Chief Complaint. You have to know that. Every one of my residents from last night in Parkland in the ER knows when they come and sit down and talk to me, and they start talking, I have Judy Jones here, has this and that, I go, why are they here? Chief complaint. Um, this is where they tell you what brought them in that day. That's on the emergent side. On the non-emergent side, if you're doing an H&P, history and physical, <clears throat> on a patient for a routine physical, then it, it may be that they don't have a chief com complaint that day. If someone does have a chief complaint, then you've got to get into it and find out what's the story. For example, and you can use the term Socrates, but basically I want to know, well, tell me more about it. When did it start? <clears throat> Um, how long has it been there? Have you had it before? If there's a pain, where's the pain? Do you feel the pain elsewhere? That's called referral of the pain. What's the severity of the pain? And so forth. Um, <clears throat> and you can use this Socrates mnemonic, but you, you will get in the habit of wanting to characterize the complaint. If it's uh, sweet Sue who comes in and she's burning when she pees, how long has she been burning when she pees? Uh, when did it start? <clears throat> has she had it before? Um, and she, if she had it before, did she, did she see a doctor? Did, did the doctor do a urine culture? Do I have that result? And so forth and so forth. As you begin to explore the nature of the condition, <clears throat> then you want to find out more about the patient. <clears throat> you especially want to know certain things, kidney disease, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, asthma, any medications that they're taking. This is called finding out about the patient's past medical history, you have to, have to write that down. Ladies and gentlemen, focus right here. <clears throat> you must ask the allergies of the patient. I know you know that, but if you give a patient a medication that it turns out they're allergic to, and it's somewhere in a medical record, and you didn't ask, you're gonna hurt somebody, and you're gonna get sued. Do not make that mistake. Whenever old Ray Boy here writes a script, <clears throat> Before I sit down, or when I'm sitting down to write the script, I look at allergies next. <clears throat> and if it's not been filled out, I go ask the patient. You must do that. Number two, if you have a female that could possibly be of childbearing age, you want to know when their last menstrual period was, and when the last menstrual period was before that. Are they normal? Are they on birth control? And then you want gravida and parastatus. Gravidus, gravida is G-R-A-V-I-D-A. G-R-A-V-I-D-A is how many times you've been pregnant and how many live births have you had and how many abortions or non-live births have you had. You must ask that. Don't just depend on a pregnancy test. A good doctor will ask that. Find out about the patient's family history. Is a, you know, You'll have a 50-year-old guy coming in with odd chest pain. And you need to know that his father had a heart attack when he was 65 that took his life away. That makes that man much more likely to have a heart disease himself or herself. Social history means, <clears throat> do they smoke? Do they drink? Where do they live? Um, I always ask the patient, uh, where do you live? Where's your family? Is your family outside? How'd you get here tonight? I had a guy with chest pain recently who came in with chest pain with a prior heart attack who actually came into triage, they showed me his cardiogram down the hall. I said, holy moly. I went down there, saw the guy. He was having chest pain, nice fellow. He'd had a previous, we call it a zipper. He'd had his uh, heart operated on for a bypass. And the poor guy had taken a bus with chest pain to get to the hospital, bless his poor heart. Um, you need to know those kinds of things because you have to take care of the total patient. For example, 
what is the greatest, I am 67 years old. You take somebody 65 to 75 and above, what is the greatest likelihood that they may run into a problem at home? What is it? The answer is they may fall. Well, I don't care about all that. They got family. You have to care. It is your job as a doctor to make sure that your patient is safe to be at home, including the term is called ADL, write that down, activities of daily living. You have to know that, you have to explore it. And if your patient is unable to complete ADLs, you must deal with them until such a time as their needs such as food, uh, such as uh, peeing and pooping, uh, getting around, uh, cleaning and so forth, uh, can be taken care of. <clears throat> Next point is a thing called the ROS, which is the review of systems. This is where you gather enough information about what is called every organ system, the eyes, the hearing, the sense of taste, the neurological system, the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, the gastrointestinal system, in the setting of females, the gynecologic system, um, uh, the orthopedic, musculoskeletal system, neurological, and so forth. You have to get all that down. You see all the headings under A down there. You have to get sufficient information in all those called the review of systems. <clears throat> and then at some point, you will summarize your history by reviewing what the patient has told you. And, to, and if necessary, you have to clarify those points uh, with the patient, including answering in the, any of the questions that the patient may have during or after the history taken. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude the history point, by and large, patients that come to see you fall into two types. Those with a confidence that they're taking care of their medical situation and that what they're doing is there for a routine checkup and so forth, which is a wonderful thing. Family medicine is bedrock infrastructure in medicine in this country today. Or they're coming in because something is going on and they are terrified. They may not show it but you have to get to that terror for that patient and deal with that condition because it's the right thing to do. It is perfectly okay to do things for people simply for the fact that it is the validity of that it's the right thing to do. It's true and you must do that because if you do do that, you'll be a great doctor and you must be a great doctor. You cannot get into medicine for any other reason than to be a part of this wonderful, blessed thing called taking care of our patients. We'll go through two more parts and then we'll take a pause for questions <clears throat> and I will go drink some water so I'll stop clearing my throat. The physical exam, the, the, the history, your expertise and experience will guide you with the passing years. The physical exam requires the expertise of passing experience. And you can either get good at it or you can be a rank amateur. You do not want to be an amateur. You must approach the patient in a way that goes from top to bottom. I'll show you a graphic of that in just a moment. It is systematic. You approach the patient in an orderly way. Focus. Look here. Do not leave out steps. If you don't look, you will not see. Now, I know that's simple, but if you don't look, you won't see. And so the sign of the expert is the person who can quickly look and see without having to spend a lot of time doing that. I had a very nice young man came to see me recently with an odd chest pain. <clears throat> and I sat, <clears throat> it brought me his EKG, I saw him in triage. <clears throat> and I noticed in triage because I looked that he had neck vein distension in a man that I was worried that had pericarditis. If I had not looked, I would not have seen, but you must look. And growing expertise lets you know the steps that you need to see and that you can form them very quickly without taking a lot of time. Now, as you're walking in to see the patient, XABC, do this right now, repeat it after me, ready? XABC, I will never waste your time in an academic environment, and that is what this is. This is virtual shadowing. And we've done some frequently answered questions on the website yesterday to answer your questions. You know, can you put this on an application and so forth? This is an, is an academic setting. I'll never waste your time. You know, I work in the busiest emergency department in the United States. I was there yesterday taking care of some of the sickest people in the world. And I will tell you, you walk in the room and you quickly 
look for signs that the patient is in acute distress. Do I see external bleeding? Is the airway okay? Any signs of, uh, of air hunger, respiratory distress? Is, is my circulatory assessment okay? If that part is okay, focus, look, you've got a minute. You may not have 10 minutes, but you've got a minute. You've got a minute to collect your thoughts. You've got a minute to not do anything stupid. You've got a minute not to give a patient the medicine, a medicine that they don't need. You have a minute to communicate with the nurse says, let's go ahead and start an IV. Get him on the monitor, please. Draw some blood. We're going to do the routine stuff for a cardiac workup. Get all, get all that going, please. Let's get a 12 lead EKG. D EKG going, Mr. Jones, this is Dr. Fowler. I'm going to be your doctor today, and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to get you some medicine. What's going on? You're hurting in your heart? Okay. Have you had this pain before? Well, we'll get you some medicine. Nurse, let's go ahead and get some out nitroglycerin. So I'm going to just take care of you now. Uh, when did this pain start? Hmm. We, we, where else do you feel it? Do you feel it up in your shoulders or feel it in your back or down in your stomach anywhere? And I know that sounds kind of country, and maybe I should. That's just the country boy coming out of me. But a nice, easy, slow way of approaching your patient, articulating very carefully, as opposed to, hello, Mr. Jones, chest pain, huh? Okay, how long has it been there? Don't do that. The messages that it sends are all wrong. The patient feels insufficient. They feel unacknowledged. They feel that they're a bother to you. It's, well, Mr. Jones, I'm Dr. Fowler. I'm gonna take care of you today. Yeah, what's going on? Your chest is hurting. Really? Well, nurse, let's bring that some of that nitro medicine. Yeah, sure. So how long has it been hurting? Is it hurting right now? Does it hurt when you breathe? Take a long, deep breath for me. Does that hurt when you do that? Show me right where it hurts when you do that. Well, okay. Well, we're going to take care of that now and so forth. <clears throat> At some point, you're going to be getting a set of vital signs. <clears throat> and then you take a top to bottom approach on the patient, which I'll go over on the next slide. Look at me. Do not leave out steps. For example, we're going to start with the head, go to the neck, go to the chest, go to the abdomen, go to the pelvis, onto the extremities, onto the back. We'll do a neuro exam as well, and then we will summarize what we see on physical exam. I will cover that again on the next slide. A, man who may, a patient who may have congestive heart failure or a massive pulmonary embolism uh, or other reasons for volume overload, um, and so forth, or renal failure, may have an overall systemic <clears throat> vascular volume overload. Where does it show up? It backs up off the heart. Where? Into the veins. Veins like what? Neck veins. Anybody's neck veins are distended when they're flat, but if your neck veins are distended when you're sitting upright, something's wrong. If you don't look for neck veins, you're an amateur. I always look. I, so, hey, how are you doing? Look at the neck, and I'll, sh and I'll show you that in the next slide. Experience will help you with that. So there's several, this is a busy slide. I'm gonna cover the five quick points that you see to the left-hand part of the slide. Generally speaking, number one, you're looking, you're inspecting. Number two, you're touching, which is called palpating, it's touching. You can percuss, percussion is kind of a lost art. It's where you actually do thumping on the chest and on the abdomen, it's kind of a lost art, just sort of like ophthalmoscopy is for many, many physicians today looking in the back of the eye. You listen, I find that the uh, stethoscope is for many people, sadly, unfortunately, a lost art or they never got it, <clears throat> but I carry a stethoscope. I know of one physician, dear friend of mine, who doesn't carry a stethoscope because he says he doesn't need it. I have to have it. And, um, and I, I, I like to think I'm pretty good at it. And then the neurological exam, which we'll come to in just a moment. So please look at the figure, this very simple figure on the right-hand side. I drew this this afternoon. Here is the body. Look at that arrow. I'm going to the patient's eyes and face once I've got the XABC out of the way, right? XABC, we said that. External bleeding, airway, quality of the respiration, status of the circulation, and then I'm going to the head. Head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. Pupils equal around reactive light and combination. Um, um, fundoscopic if I need it. I look in the ears for any sign of uh, infection, earwax occlusion, etc. I feel the scalp, I, lo I look at the nose, I touch the sinuses, I look in the mouth. I then look at the neck. What does it look like? Is there anything obvious about it? Any evidence of trauma? Is there any evidence of neck vein distension? I look at the trachea, is it in the midline? I feel the thyroid, I always feel the thyroid. You say, Fowler, you can't possibly do that. Guy comes in with a sore throat, you got 10 patients waiting and you feel the thyroid, you're lying to me. Yes, I do. It takes this long, it takes no time. 
experience guides you. I've seen my first couple of hundred thousand patients, so I, I ought to be pretty good at it by now. But yes, I do do that. So the head, as I mentioned, and the neck, JVD, jugular venous dissension, neck vein. I look at the thyroid, and then I come down to the chest. You have to bear the chest uh, if it's of a opposite sex, or some could argue for any patient for that matter. Have appropriate chaperoning in your room. Bear the chest. What does it look like? Is it symmetrical? And so forth. We can't go through all the elements of the exam. Breath sounds. Are they present? Are they equal? Do you hear any sounds that are normal breath sounds versus abnormal breath sounds that should not be there. They are wheezes, rowels, ronchi, and strider. Going further than that is beyond the scope of this particular discussion. If you would like to hear more about breath sounds exams or heart sounds exams, put it into the chat and direct it toward one of the students, and we will do another session on that at a later time, perhaps in July. But then you look at the abdomen, and you start by looking at the belly. What do you see? What does it look like? <clears throat> Generally speaking, the abdomen tends to be flat unless they're fat, excuse me, unless they're cal calorically challenged. And then the abdomen is above plane, or they're very underweight, and the abdomen is scaffold. Uh, it, do, do you see anything obvious about it? Any penetrating injuries? What do the, uh, what do the bowel sounds sound like? Any evidence of hernias? Do you find pain? Palpating means feeling the abdomen is a relatively lost art, I think, today. And to get good at that so you can feel what you feel without causing a symptom by pushing too fast <clears throat> and too hard, and then you create pain that's not really there, for example. And then the pelvis, and then uh, the extremities, uh, and then a quick neurological exam for symmetry of motor, uh, uh, sensation, reflexes, and then looking at the skin as well. I go from head to toe, including the back, and then I finish up in a very orderly process. This will be the last part before we take a break for questions. <clears throat> now at some point, as you get into medicine, you're, after your history and after your physical, you're gonna have to decide if it is, a, it is appropriate to do some test ordering. I had some patients last night, I didn't, did not order any tests on at all. On the other hand, I did a bunch of COVID testing last night. What do you need? How quickly can I get the test back? What particular test? For example, I had a patient uh, last evening who had a terrible backache, and should I do a CAT scan or should I do an MRI scan? CAT scan is a couple of thousand dollars, plus or minus. MRI scan could be $5,000. Is the patient gonna pay? I don't know. That's a tremendous amount of money. <clears throat> so the considering of the patient's financial concerns. But on the other hand, well, will I see what I see with a CAT scan? I won't see the spinal cord with a CAT scan. I will see it with an MRI scan. And for example, with CAT scans pretty quick, it takes a minute or two. MRI scan, the guy might have to lie still for two hours. Can he stand that? Very important consideration. Um, so you, you must take into consideration, among other things, the financial burden. And when you work it with people who are adequately insured, you tend to not consider quite so much um, the issue of what it costs, though the, 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 these cost concerns are very important. Okay, we've been going for 40 minutes. I apologize for the snafo a moment ago. We now have 427 of you wonderful people out there. And we're going to take a break uh, for questions and answers. And Shayon, you're in charge. What happens now? Yes, I am. So y'all feel free to keep uh, asking your questions in the chat. We actually have a lot of questions now, so we're going to do our best to pick the ones that we think may be important. And uh, we'll try to answer the other ones later as well. So it looks like the first question here is, uh, how would one deal or approach a situation when having a patient that had deceived you for the benefits after running so many tests? As a provider, how would you deal with that situation? Depends on what they deceived me for. <clears throat> for example, I've been working in the ER over four decades. ER is where people came for chronic pain for years and years, whether it's migraines, back pain, so forth. We prescribe lots and lots of narcotics. That era is pretty, pretty well over now because virtually all states now have a narcotics registry, meaning uh, what the term is called schedule drugs. This is like hydrocodone, codeine, um, morphine, um, so forth, um, oxy oxycodone and so on. These are narcotic pain pills. And so the era of people, people now know if they have a pain problem, they need to be under care of a pain specialist rather than going from hospital to hospital, ER to ER, doc to doc, and going in with that look like this, you know, on a scale of one to 10, what's your pain? It's an 11. And 
<clears throat> and in fact, you go into the narcotics registry and you see that they've had a prescription for 90 pills every two weeks for years. And you ask yourself, well, what's the real emergency here? The real emergency may be that they're out of narcotic pain pills and they're actually in narcotic withdrawal or the patient may be selling the pills. They might be. So the, the, the issue of deception is one that one cannot let an intrinsic bias build. You must not get angry. You must not hold it against the patient. You have to accept these facts of what you think may, de may be deception. Deception may be something that's not necessarily proved. So that you weigh the whole thing so that you can optimize the care for your patient. Shayon, next question. Sure, thank you. So the next question would be, uh, how does a physical exam differ for pediatrics? That's a great question. I'm making a note here. Um, <clears throat> kids are little adults, except they're not little adults. And it depends on if you ask a pediatrician or an emergency physician that question. Kids are humans. They have the same human physiology, but the numbers are a lot different. Their pulse rates are higher. Their blood pressure is lower. Um, um, very young children don't yet speak English, and uh, they don't speak any language. I'm sorry that, if that was insensitive. They don't speak any language. So, you know, they go, wah, and that's all you got. And so the communications may be quite a challenge. Uh, parental interaction may be quite a challenge at times as well. Dosing is most certainly a challenge. Uh, and whereas adults, we may be used to 250 milligrams of this and 500 milligrams of that for a normal size adult. For kids, it's milligrams per kilo of certain types of drugs, and you have to do that or you could overdose or underdose the children. So, Shayon, to summarize, I would say that it has to do with uh, vital signs, with interpersonal interaction, and with the issue of dosing. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and so the next question would be uh, How is mental health tied into your practice? Uh, this person says that they've heard of many situations of doctors ignoring mental health issues. Is this a bias that you have to unlearn? You know, that which connects us to infinity is, is our mind. If you'll go to the session, uh, let me encourage you to go to the website, virtualshadowing.com, go to the sessions, which I think is the third link. Go to the bottom of the session page and you'll see a uh, paper, The Mind and the Brain, that I uh, put, put there for the first session two weeks ago. I urge you to read that. It talks about the fact that the human mind is not all within the scope of your cranium, but rather it is connected. Your mind is, in significant part, the interactions you've had with the environment and with others. It is not just within. Indeed, if you take somebody and you, if I retired to my cabin and didn't go outside or anything and didn't interact at all, I would be closing... <clears throat> closing in my mind. So the mind is the gateway to the soul. It's the gateway to the patient. <clears throat> now, having said that, <clears throat> plenty of your patients are going to be dealing with depression, anxiety, substance use, substance abuse, alcoholism, um, heroin, drugs, other drugs, um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and so forth. These are all part of the patient's condition. A patient's, uh, there's a word I saw in the news today called agoraphobia, I know the word, which means a fear of going outside, and that there's this shadowing thing, excuse me, start over, you're shadowing, I'm sorry, this um, COVID thing, epidemic thing, causing people to distance, socially distance was the, was the word I was searching for, to stay indoors has got people away from people very much. Now, expressing a fear of going outside, which is called agoraphobia, a link between COVID disease and actually a fear of going outside. It's very real. So you cannot separate the mental framework of the individual that you're taking care of from the physical aspects as well, because they are inherently tied together. Someone who is anxious, pain may be much worse, and calming them can make the pain better. This is why a sedative alone decreases the perception of pain. Not a narcotic, but just a sedative can actually decrease pain, even though it's not a pain medication, for example. So to summarize, Shayon, you have to weigh the whole patient all the time. Let's take uh, two more. 
Sure. Uh, all right. So the next question is, uh, is there a difference in assessment in a primary care provider setting versus an emergency department setting? Uh, and how does the patient doctor relationship differ uh, in the ER uh, versus an outpatient setting, I guess, to tie that in? That's a great question. I actually had the privilege of going home to my hometown in 1980, <clears throat> where I uh, built my own urgent care center while also working in and managing uh, three other emergency departments for a private hospital corporation. Um, and so I did a whole lot of family medicine when I was in my hometown. In family medicine, you develop long-term relationships with patients. They know you, it's often first name basis. Uh, you, you see their kids when they're little, you watch their kids grow, their kids get to know you, and you know, it's old gray hair, Dr. Fowler. Um, <clears throat> And I took care of people that I grew, went to high school with, a lot of them their kids, and some of them their grandkids. Um, an attorney sitting on my couch back in the office crying his eyes out because of his divorce and not knowing what's going to happen. You are the whole patient. They have your telephone, and uh, uh, they call you. and You have this ongoing long-term relationship, <clears throat> as opposed to in the emergency department where usually you don't know the person. And so you have to go in and establish a comfortable rapport quickly. Uh, in a non-threatening, friendly, relatively warm, relatively engaging way that says, hey, I'm Dr. Fowler. What's going on today? What can I do for you? You're just getting to know them. You really don't have a long-term relationship <clears throat> with them. Um, X, A, B, C, both of them. You're, you're, you are a family medicine doc. You walk in there. You make sure that no emergency is present. I'm an emergency doc, I walk in the room and I make sure at first no emergency is present. Maybe they're there because they twisted their ankle and that's why they're here. But in the meantime, no external bleeding, the airway's okay, the, 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 uh, their breathing is normal um, and their circulation status is normal. So there are some similar approaches that you must always take so that you can be safe with your patients. I will conclude <clears throat> this point, Shayon, by saying family medicine, and I'll, I've said this now twice, is a blessed part bedrock infrastructure because the, it is okay to develop, develop long-term relationships with patients who care about you and you care about them and you, you share your lives, your professional life and some of your personal life <clears throat> with their life and helping them move to a higher state of wellness. Let's take the last question for this section, Sean. Sure, thank you. So the last question is, uh, is there ever a situation where the doctor has to let a sick patient just go home because they cannot afford tests or certain procedures? Uh, and then this person says, I hope you can discuss the lack of efficient health care to people in poverty and lower class. That's a wonderful question. Um, I went home to practice medicine in a very kind of blue collar, white collar part of Western Georgia. <clears throat> it is now a suburb of Atlanta called Douglasville, my hometown, and um, uh, working in a suburban emergency department. I did that for 20 years, a total time in the burbs of 23 years in Georgia. And then I retired at age 47 and decided to do something nice and quiet, so I came to Parkland Hospital. Parkland is a level one trauma center. It, it is a significantly indigent care hospital that takes care of a great deal of the poor people of the downtown Dallas County, uh, city of Dallas area, and the North Texas area. <clears throat> uh, we, we are a predominantly, though not entirely, indigent care uh, hospital. Uh, I rarely think about cost very much uh, in this setting because um, we are not pressed so much, so much in this particular setting of a of, a, of an of, we're, we're the busiest emergency department in the United States, partly, uh, and one of the largest hospitals. And we are not pressed so much about cost control, though you can't order a five thousand dollar test on everybody because that would begin to say, "What in the world are you doing, Fowler?" Um, um, in this setting, it doesn't come up often for me that I can't do what I need to do by and large. In the setting of suburbia, where I came from. Um, the issue of a patient who really needed, for example, to have a surgery done and there were, but had no insurance coverage or no Medicaid, no Medicare and so forth, that I would have to go find a facility that would be willing to do it as what was called a charity case. I don't like that term, but that is the term that we use. And so we would have to make those judgments. Uh, 
I am now an old man in my practice of medicine. If this is the bell curve of careers, I'm over here. Y'all are over here. Um, I, I choose this environment. I choose very much to be able to do what I need to do for the patient when they need it, because that's, that to me allows me to optimize the care of the patient. Okay, Shayon, uh, why don't we uh, move to the next section? Does that sound okay to everybody? Shayon, that's okay with you? Great. All good. right. <laughs> there we go. Off we go. <clears throat> and folks, uh, I think there's, bless your poor souls, there are 428 of you out there. <clears throat> We've been going now about 50 minutes, um, and I think we'll go about 25 to 30 more total. Let me also remind you that this session is available online. Uh, will be available online tomorrow, this recording, and also the exam will be available, Shayon, to the end of the week, is that right, till Friday? Yes, till Friday at 11.59 p.m. Are the questions already posted now? They're going to start, uh, they're posted at 8, uh, 8 p.m. Tonight. 8 p.m., okay, so uh -huh. be it. All right, so here we go. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, we started in talking about being non-judgmental, avoiding the anything that drags on your heart that in, in any way causes you to resist the empathic response to connecting with humans. The best thing I do in my life, ladies and gentlemen, is to sit at the bedside of Aunt Minnie when she is terrified and hold her hand, taking part of her pain into me. You gotta be careful about that because you can make yourself a little mentally too attached because there are going to be times, especially in the emergency environment, where you have to do things that, are, that are, may not be pleasant. And if you get caught up in the patient's terror, and it can happen. I felt that when I was much younger, <clears throat> that you can perhaps not be able to think quite so clearly. This is why physicians should not take care of their families, especially in life-threatening crises. You, you don't belong in there. You can't think rationally, think clearly. I drew the blood on my niece when she was two and a half to find out she had leukemia. I could not think rationally. I was there when my dad had his heart attack, ultimately took his life. I could not think rationally when that occurred and so forth. And don't you do it either. <clears throat> don't resist getting connected with your patients. If you do that, you will love what you do as a physician, as a clinician. If you don't do it, you will become bored. There's a term called burnout, which we'll talk more about in a later session. Um, because patients give you a little bit back and that's, that fills your heart with something that allows you to share that and you keep paying it forward to other people. Mm -hmm. Now let's move on. This next section is really important. Ladies and gentlemen, don't get into this field unless you're going to be a great doctor. Now I know you, Many of you always say, well, of course I'm going to be a great. What are you thinking? What do you mean I'm going to be a great doctor? Mm -hmm. A great doctor does a lifetime of continual study, a lifetime. I have sitting right down here a, a book on electrocardiography, and I'm pretty good at ECGs. I'm still studying this, this book right over here. I read all the time. <clears throat> I want to give you a challenge. Um, I... Uh, this will make you smile. I have a flip phone. Yes, I actually have a flip phone, but I know all of you have smartphones. I know you do, or just about all of you. You have on your hips and your pockets every fact in the known universe. Look at me. You have no excuse. You have no excuse. If you come across a fact, a formula, a, an x ray, an electrocardiogram, you have no excuse. You have the fact right there, and if you don't look it up, it is because you are lazy. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is a fact that you need to know to care for the patients that you see, if you don't look up that fact and become familiar and conversant in that fact, you are not being a true applied scientist, and you're not serving your patients as well as you should. You must do this. Now, the flip side of that is, if you do that, you will be a great doctor. Um, I'm at the part of my life in my late 60s, after four decades of clinical practice, where I find that recall is a little harder than it used to be. So what I'm doing to deal with that, all of us forget things. You ever have that thing where you say, what was that guy's name? 
what was the name of that restaurant? Um, or, well, what was the name of that restaurant? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so I, I make myself go back and remember everything I've forgotten. That's just me. This is what I do because I'm, I'm trying to keep my memory going as I get into my late years. I, I would love to make 50 years of clinical practice. Now, why do I bring all this up right now? <clears throat> because to be a great doctor, you have to do what's on this slide to be a great doctor. You have to develop a differential diagnosis on your patients. Now, what does that mean? It means that many of the things that you see in patients are not clearly obvious. Now, I know that may seem obvious to you now, but wait till you're tired. I was seven hours into a shift last night when my feet were killing me. I'm an old man. I was surrounded in a busy emergency department, and I had a patient who spoke only Arabic who was there with an abdominal pain, and I was having to use Google Translator, not on this phone, um, and so forth to try to get into what was going on. Um, and so what a differential diagnosis means is the following. Please listen to this. There are conditions where it is not obvious what is wrong with the patient. And number two is, if you don't find out what's wrong with the patient, you may kill them. You won't actively kill them. But if you treat them and then they go away and you missed a problem that was serious, you may have participated in this patient's not doing well and perhaps even ultimate demise. A friend of mine, Bill, <clears throat> and he is now retired. He and I used to, he was, he's my age, <clears throat> and we used to sit around and talk about the ghosts. The ghosts, and what that was, was it was the ghosts of the patients that have come before. And what he meant was, and what Bill and I both meant was, when you've been around a long time, you're going to have a patient or two that you wish you'd done something different and the patient did not have a great outcome. And they sit back here and they remind you, you remember me when you didn't do this or you did do that? You wanna avoid the ghosts, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> and how do you do that? You develop a differential diagnosis and you act on that. Now let's talk about it. <clears throat> it's a diagnostic process in which you try to figure out what's wrong with the patient. There are some things that are straightforward. Guy comes and sees you, he was playing with a saw, and he cut himself right there. That is a cut finger. And there's little there to be concerned about other than you got to clean it up, fix it up, check his tetanus. If he's diabetic, consider some antibiotics and so forth. On the other hand, if the cut is, say, down here over the flexor tendon, and you have to explore it, and it may be that the flexor tendon sheaths involved, or if the cut is here on the side of the finger, where the artery and the nerve and the vein run, the neurovascular bundle. Well, all of a sudden you developed a differential diagnosis. We'll talk about that. <clears throat> you talk about the patient and get some symptoms and get, get some of the story, the medical history. You then examine the patient and you see what you see. And then you get some testing. And then you will begin by collecting all this information, you know, the history we talked about and how long you're experiencing your symptoms and so forth. And then you develop what's called a differential diagnosis that we'll come to on the next slide. <clears throat> Let's say a guy comes to you because he has a headache. Suddenly he's become loss of coordination. He's confused and he's having trouble with his vision. He's had a stroke before. He also smokes cigarettes on a regular basis. And now you suspect that this patient may have a stroke. Uh, we do an echocardiogram because we think a floater may have floated up from the heart as, a, as an embolus that went to his brain. Um, we inspect for the abnormal rhythm. We get a CAT scan of his head, uh, x-rays appropriately, uh, blood, blood testing for such things as clotting factors and so forth, and blood testing. And in this case, in fact, we found that it was not an embolus, but in fact, it was a hemorrhage rather than a clot that floated up to an artery the echocardiogram didn't show it, we'll say. Instead, it bled, um, the artery bled. He said, well, that doesn't happen very often. Wrong, it happened yesterday in my ER. And so, what am I talking about? <clears throat> There's some things that are rel relatively straightforward, like a, a little cut finger here. Um, but there's some things that are not, not straightforward. Chest pain, abdominal pain. Um, Odd neurological symptoms, something that is numb, a headache, and so forth. In these settings, 
you will have to do something where you talk to the patient, get your history, do your physical exam, and then do your testing, and then you have to sit down and do the following. You put together all the symptoms, all the physical findings, and all the testing, and then you try to develop a conclusion where you say, I think all of this comes together that I think it's this. On the other hand, several of these signs and symptoms could be several other things, so they could be that. I still think it's this. It could be that. And then you have some other signs and symptoms that might support a less likely diagnosis. I don't think it's this. And then none of the stuff that you've done, the history, the physical, or the testing, supports the fact that these diagnoses down here. And you know it's not that. Why does this matter? In a woman, for example, of childbearing years who comes in with right lower quadrant abdominal pain and you think, well, it may be an appendicitis, it could be a hernia, um, perhaps it's a, a very long gallbladder, it could be, perhaps it's a kidney stone, perhaps it's acute polynephritis, maybe it's an abdominal wall muscle strain, or maybe she's pregnant and she didn't even know that and she's got a pregnancy in her tube, and that pregnancy in her tube is about to rupture. It's about to blow up. Well, why does that matter? Because there is an artery in the fallopian tube, that, and if that ruptures and you have an acute arterial bleed into their peritoneal, cav peritoneal cavity, the abdominal cavity, they'll die. Well, you'd feel like a really idiot if you missed that. You say, well, holy cow, well, at least that's, the only one I got to think about, it's the abdominal pain in females. Yeah, right. What about chest pain in a guy who is 37 and he has no cardiac history. He's a marathon athlete um, and he happens to be, you know, six foot six, big guy, big, tall hands, kind of a long face like this. And he comes in with chest pain. Pain radiates through to his back. He doesn't have a cardiac history in his family. He uses the occasional uh, tobacco cig cigarette. But it's just sort of an odd story, but it's a chest pain. Chest pain, we immediately think it's something cardiac, it's ischemic, meaning heart attack type stuff. Well, big tall guy, if, if you knew this already with big hands, we think of a thing called Marfan syndrome, where people have congenital connective disease, disease abnormalities, and in fact could have a dissecting aortic aneurysm in the, in the uh, thoracic and abdominal aorta. If you don't know it, you won't think of it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, to finish this slide, and we're, we're getting close to the end now, we're probably gonna stop in about 10 or 15 minutes, and I really appreciate that over 400 of you are still out there, bless your hearts. Look at me. If a patient may have something, it could, what do you, I think it's this, but if they may have something, it could be this, and you haven't ruled it out, and it could be serious, then you be careful. I work in a residency training program with um, uh, a very competitive residency. We have 66 residents, 22 per year, three years. Many of you on this uh, program tonight will end up in e EM residency, and I hope that one of you one day will come to Parkland. And if so, remind me that you saw this program years from now. <clears throat> and um, it's interesting how when you're very young and you're very tired, this, I don't mean this to be insulting in any way but when it's very young and very tired it's easy to jump well it's probably this probably this if you haven't ruled out this if you haven't ruled it out and it could be there and it could harm the patient you be careful because that patient may get into trouble and you may you may be more than just in part responsible for a patient having a very bad outcome how does that make you feel about the practice of medicine well, I hope it makes you feel okay. Ladies and gentlemen, medicine is the mix of applied science with the desire to help a person reach a higher state of wellness. It is always that, and you can't ever separate those. So it's the opportunity to learn your applied science that you can get involved with other people. You have to be a thinking doc, a thinking physician is not an oxymoron. You're an applied scientist. You have to do continuous study in your field. I promise you, you find one field you're interested in and somehow it relates to what we're doing here in some way. 
I challenge you. You find it, send me a question. Send any one of the group a question, uh, either via chat or via an email. We'll look it up together. So if it interests you, it interests us. The same thing as I said a while ago, that if it's in your job and you have to know it, you have to look it up and not forget it. It's a state of continuous rehearsal. <clears throat> so as we begin to wrap up here, the takeaway then is that the differential diagnosis is a list of possible conditions. You have to put it all together. The cut finger may be easy, but regardless of how obscure a diagnosis is, especially when you're tired, most people do okay. Most people coming to the 300 plus thousand patients a year that come to Parkland ER, most people are going to do fairly well. And as long as I don't do something stupid, give them a medicine that they're allergic to or hurt them somehow, they're probably going to be okay by and large. But there's some people that are not going to be okay. That in fact, it was a rupturing ectopic pregnancy. I had a patient a few months ago who had no idea that, this, that in her 40s, could possibly have been pregnant and came in with a rupturing ectopic pregnancy. I didn't believe it, but it was. You have to be very careful. You have to always create a differential diagnosis. There was a great master, Sir Zachary Cope, who was a great uh, English surgeon who wrote the book, The Early Diagnosis uh, of the Acute Abdomen. I actually have a second edition of that from 1927. And this is what he said. Well, he's, he said the thing down below. Ladies and gentlemen, the difference between a generalist, an average physician, and a specialist is in the rigor of the application of a differential diagnosis. I urge you to go to the web, look up New England Journal of Medicine, and look up one of their clinical pathological conferences, any one of them, pick one, where they have the pro from Dover come in to talk about something. It's a rash, it's an autoimmune disease, it's multiple sclerosis, it's you name it. And this is a person, I said guy, that's a generic term, who knows everything, everything, about that disease, everything. This is what a specialist does. Emergency medicine is exceptionally challenging because we see every condition of every age group, of every gender, at all hours, in all languages, especially at Parkland, at all hours of the day. But you have to do it. The difference between a generalist and a specialist is in the rigor of the application of a differential diagnosis. After careful H, careful P, Careful labs, you go, I think it's this. Could be this. I don't think it's that. I know it's not that. Zachary Cope, great surgeon. This is back before lab tests, before x-rays, long before CAT scans. This is back when doctors were doctors and stethoscopes were stethoscopes, and they would go in there, talk to the patient, and based upon their experience, they would figure it out. Zachary Cope said this. He's, this is back when docs would sit on the bed. I still sit on the bed. Doctor would sit on the bed, talk to the patient, hold their hand, and then Cope said this. He said, never rise from the bed without completing a differential diagnosis. You're entitled to your opinions. I have my own. It is my opinion as a medical school professor and as a teacher in a residency training program that we, we don't do a great job of teaching the concept of differential diagnosis today. I welcome you to come to our medical school and the medical schools in America and the PA schools and nursing practitioner schools and learn how to create a differential diagnosis because that will make you a great clinician. And you don't want to do that for any other reason. You got to consider the cost about what you're ordering, uh, the patient's financial conditions. You gotta consider the treatment costs. Patients may have a difficult time paying for their medications. Look at this. <clears throat> there was an interesting article. Um, Shayon, remind me please, and let me post that uh, um, Akala Brutnib article uh, on, uh, on the website. I, I challenge you, I dare you, to read an article that, that was in Science Magazine almost two weeks ago on a drug called Akala Brutnib. It is a brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitor which inhibits the activation of NF-kappa B. I know you don't, some, most of you won't know that, which is, then stimulates the uh, interleukins, which stimulates the cytokine storm, which is what causes death in COVID disease. Turns out there's a, that as published two weeks ago uh, in uh, Science Magazine, which unlike the remdesivir story, which made front page news and affected the stock market by 3,000 points, this one didn't get much... Um, Press, uh, Acalabrutinib, which is calquince, is the name of the drug, 
is a drug for lymphoma that's already improved, and it's actually a capsule, and um, it's available, and actually it's taken by capsule, and the small study that if, I, if you, uh, Sharon, remind, remind me, I will post it on the website tonight, read it. It's a very technical article from Science Magazine, but it'll open your eyes to the activation of the immune system and the damage caused by the COVID disease and the cytokine storm. This drug is already available. Look, and here is your goodrxdrugs.com uh, cost on this thing for two months of the drug. It's about $15,000, and that's with a coupon. Who in the world can afford that? My goodness. One in three Americans are financially burdened by their medical expenses, and how can we help reduce that financial burden? Well, we can help them take care of themselves. Don't smoke. Lose some weight. Take care of your blood pressure. Watch your blood sugar. And, and so forth. The things that are of chronic disease, get a checkup. Funny chest pain, turns out it was an artery thing, get it fixed, and then you live m many more healthy years. And so having a physician patient cost conversation is appropriate at some time in the treatment. Communication skills always think of the empathic communication. Look people in the eye, slow down a little bit, feel and show a warm, genuine interest which enhances your understanding and will make for a more successful treatment environment. There are many health disparities we have to deal with, including from poverty, uh, inadequate access to health care, educational inequalities, environmental threats, ethnicity, sex, age, and so forth. And how do we address these health disparities? Uh, we, the problem with patient care is that it weighs on us nearly every day now in the New York Times, CNN, um, Wall Street Journal and other places, NPR and others, you see articles about physicians suffering because patients are suffering. This COVID thing is wearing out physicians and nursing and other staff in hospitals right now. It is a very important time to try to find a treatment for this drug, uh, for this disease, a drug that will treat this disease so at least people won't die of this because that is what we're so scared of right now. As I wrap up, this is a phrase I like to say, and I share this with my residents. I shared this last night with my, one of my residents. Old emergency docs like me, we don't die, so to speak. Our sensitivity goes up. Our specificity goes down. What does that mean? Sensitivity means how good are you? If you have a, pa a <clears throat> excuse me, a hundred patients with a disease, how good is your exam? Can old Fowler here find all hundred of them? Or let's say out of the 100, I missed one of them. So I found 99 of the diseases out of the 100 patients. Well, if I missed one out of 100, that's, I found 99 out of 100. That's a 99% sensitivity. So if something has a high sensitivity, it means it's going to find it. One of the problems with some of the COVID testing is that the sensitivity may not be all that high, which means it's a false negative. <clears throat> but specificity is where... I go see a patient and I say, you know, I think they have this and you know, that's bad enough where I'm gonna put them in the hospital because I'm concerned. The patient's old, they're frail, they may fall down. They may not be able to take care of themselves. I'm not sure where their family is. I'm gonna put them in the hospital. I get a phone call back from uh, the admitting doc a day or two later says, Fowler, you idiot. They didn't have that and they just wasted two days in the hospital. And, go, and I say to myself, you know what? This was a frail little old guy who might have fallen at home, broken his hip, and that would have been the end of him, broken hip, pneumonia, sepsis, death. And so what did I do? I opted to take care of the whole patient. I am a very careful person. Please, as you're getting into medicine, have a lower sensitivity, meaning the fact, don't worry so much that you have a false positive. You say, I'm concerned enough that I'm gonna look after the whole patient. So to close, I want to thank you for coming. This means an awful lot to us. Uh, the, the working group, all these lovely folks that I get to work with, uh, especially Shayon tonight, whom you met. It's just an absolute honor to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. We'll keep going as long as you want us to. Go to the FAQs on the website, virtualshadowing.com. We wrote this yesterday. Let us know what you'd like to see. Uh, we're going to be talking about a day in the life of the emergency doc next week. We're going to talk about COVID disease. COVID disease is very interesting. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about uh, disaster medicine and its impact on America and the world. Dr. Ray Swinton, Division Chief for Disaster Medicine at Southwestern, will join us. 
Um, and then after that, uh, we're going to just go with what you want. And as long as you keep asking us, we're going we're gonna to keep doing it. To close, you want to be a great clinician. Don't get into this business unless you want to do the applied science to better the condition for people as, as an agreement, as a partnership in healthcare. But it's not just that you want to be a great clinician, is that if you're gonna do medicine, you got to be a great clinician. One of the tips, smartphone, look it up. Every single thing, every single time, look it up. You'll see, it'll make a difference. But you must do this, ladies and gentlemen, because it's the right thing to do. It's an absolute honor to be with you. Thank you for your attention that we've had 400 people come. Bless your hearts. Appreciate you coming and spending your evening with us. And uh, that's a wrap. This assessment is due, uh, the test, the exam is due. For, well, Cheyenne, you still got a, you awake over there? You got a pulse? Yes, sir, I am. So, yeah, tell, tell them about the exam. Yes, so the exam should be open by now. Um, we're going to make sure that the link works. What you're going to want to do is just go to the regular QuestBase website and enter the PIN that we sent you in the email. Uh, I think that way the link uh, is not going to crash on you. I think there's going to be a couple of problems about that. So uh, that's going to be due uh, this Friday at 11.59 p.m. So as long as you do that before that time, you will get, as long as you also get a 70% or higher on that assessment. Um, and so again, you know, feel free to follow us on our social media. It's listed right here on the slide. We have a YouTube and on our website. Um, and as, oh yes, you want to say something? Um, only that uh, now if they get a 70 or above do they they get a certificate or something suitable for framing or something yes they do uh, so yes if you do pass this assessment you'll automatically get at the end of the assessment uh, a certificate that proves that you completed that session so that is for you to keep all right you want to do five or ten minutes more questions yes sir let's do it all right and then so also uh for this question and answer session we have a special guest his name is dr brandon morchetti he's with <laughs> us today <laughs> i'm in trouble so, now yes, so allow, so allow me to introduce dr brandon morchetti who is the associate uh, ems division chief for the division of emergency medical services at ut southwestern he is also a tactical swat doc and uh, he works with Dallas Fire Rescue as well. And he was with me in Parkland ER just yesterday. Dr. Morchetti, are you out there? I am, yeah. I, I had uh, sent you a, a text to let you know I was on, but you know, flip phone and all. So. <laughs> oh, is it on my flip phone? Well, there you are. Okay, well, there it is. I have to put a quarter in it, but go, okay, go ahead. You got a question? Uh, no, no, no question for me. I was listening intently. Uh, you guys are very lucky to uh, be learning. Dr. Fowler, I did residency with him at Parkland um, a few years ago, and now I'm just entering my third year as faculty working alongside him. Even um, last night, he was still uh, teaching me a few things, so uh, we're all lucky to be hearing from him. I'm happy to participate in any, any Q&A and any future sessions you guys want to. So, uh, Dr. Morchetti, what is Fowler's first law? Um, always explain a tachycardia. And what in the world does that mean? Um, that means if I'm going to discharge somebody who uh, has a heart rate of greater than 100, I better have a good explanation for why it remains greater than 100, because most of the time that portends badness. But that also means you have to look and see the vital signs, doesn't it? <laughs> right. They have to have been done, and I have to be aware of them. <laughs> Well, thank you, Brandon. We'll stay, stay with us and try to pitch in on the questions too. Shayan, let's take one or two questions and then we'll knock off. All right, let's do it. Uh, so the first question here I have is, how do you gain your patient's trust on the first visit? Brandon, why don't you take that? How do you gain their trust on the first visit? Yeah, that's actually uh, one of the cool parts about emergency medicine specifically is that we meet these patients in a pretty vulnerable time. Uh, we have all of just a few seconds to have a, a develop a rapport with them. And, um, you know, it starts with uh, kind of an open stance, uh, soft tone in your voice, very uh, compassionate approach to the patient, um, you know, the acknowledging their, their fears of that situation. Um, these are the things that, you know, kind of the art and uh, uh, the approach to patient care, the history and physical. And so that trust can be developed pretty quickly. It can also be destroyed pretty quickly. You think that eye contact has a little bit to do with trust, Brandon? 
Very much so, uh, and not eye contact where you're, um, you know, towering over them. Uh, you get down at their level on a chair next to them in their bed. Uh, what's the worst news you had to give a patient in the last few months? Just you can kind of uh, summarize kind of a worst kind of news you had to give a patient. Um, in which you know, your rapport me, made a, in which your rapport made a difference. Yeah, the uh, the worst kind of news uh, to me um, is not so much I give to the patient; it's what I give to the family members when the patient doesn't make it. Um, and in those situations, there, um, you know, you try to set the environment um, up for um, making it as comfortable as possible. Um, you, I can't um, exactly tell you, you know how to be compassionate is just something that you either have or, or you learn, but that compassion has to come across uh, pretty early on that, um, you know, I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, you know, we, we tried everything that we can. Um, you know, unfortunately your loved one was too sick. And so um, it's, it's the family after a patient dies, the family then becomes my patient. Um, that's probably one of the more challenging uh, situations that a physician has to deal with. So, Brandon, how do you deal with a patient who comes in uh, and brought to you, let's say you're in pod L, which, folks, is the critical care pod at heart in the ER, and a patient is, you know, it's a, an adult male, obviously well-built, who is wi wildly agitated. And uh, how do you, uh, and you have no other history. Uh, cops brought him in, and the guy is just wildly agitated. Uh, do you just immediately throw him to the ground and handcuff him or what do you try to do? What, what is your order of how you would deal with it? Uh, when I'm working with SWAT, yeah. Uh, uh, no, when I'm in the ER, um, one of the first things that I've uh, learned is that you cannot raise your voice to match theirs. Uh, you actually, you go down a level or two um, what they're at and uh, um, decrease the number of people in the room with you. Uh, as long as it's safe to do so. And you'll find that you'll de-escalate uh, that patient pretty quickly. And then you acknowledge, um, you know, why he's angry. Um, you know, is there anything I can give you right now to, to help you? Or, you know, tell me how I can help make this situation better for you or help me help you, you know, and things like that. Uh, but first and foremost is your um, nonverbal communication, eye communication, open posture, uh, and lowering your voice a little bit lower than his. Would you ever ask him if, if he was hungry, needed a drink of water, wanted a sandwich or something? Would you ever ask him that? Oh, yeah, all the time. That's actually one of my go-tos. Um, <laughs> are you hungry, thirsty? Can I get you anything to eat or drink? Yeah. Turkey yeah. sandwich goes yeah. well with PCP and meth. Yeah. Um, Cheyenne, let's take one more. Let's do it. Um, and also before the next question, I think some of the students want to see the slide before just for the information on um, at the very end. Uh, yes, it's like the assessment slide at the end. Yep, I got it. Um, all right. And uh, here, I'm sorry, I just messed up. I'll get it. I'll get it up. There it oh, is. No, you're... <laughs> uh, there we are. <clears throat> all right, let's take one more. All right. So I just got a question recently, actually, and this is for Dr. Morchetti. Um, so it says, Dr. Fowler described Dr. Moschetti as being a SWAT dog. Uh, what does that involve? How did Dr. Moschetti's career lead him to this path? And what exactly does a SWAT doctor do? Um, did he go to medical school in the military? Is that like kind of how it works? Uh, there's a lot of pathways uh, to become a, a SWAT physician. There are very few SWAT teams around the country that use physicians as tactical medical providers. Most of the time, it's like, um, I was a paramedic for the first 12 years of my career, which is how I got into doing this, um, then became a physical therapist, then went to medical school because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to be. When I up. So when I became a, uh, an ER doc, I wanted to get back into EMS. And so I did an EMS fellowship. Part of that fellowship was doing uh, tactical police officer training. So um, I'm a, a full SWAT operator, and Dallas happens to be one of the cities that uses physicians on their team. So we're dressed up in, uh, you know, full heavy armor, vests, weapons, and, and the such. And uh, you can't tell us apart from the rest of the team. And uh, we do high-risk warrants, uh, hostage situations, um, active shooters, um, uh, just all kinds. There was an active shooter situation at our mall here in North Texas just a, a little while ago. 
Um, so uh, we provide care for civilians, uh, officers, and we do it in a kind of a high threat, austere environment. It's fun. My wife hates it. But that's uh, we still have 350 people online. Uh, Brandon, hang in there for a minute. Uh, Sharon, let's do another one. Sure, let's do it. Um, okay, so the next one, I guess, would be, okay, here's one. Uh, this question is, do physicians, PAs, and NPs often consult other practitioners to make their differential diagnoses? You bet. Absolutely. Um, the art is to talk to the patient, do the exam, order testing, try to figure out through the differential diagnosis process, what you think it is, um, what it could be, what you doubt it is, and what you know it's not. It is often that the patient who either you think it's this or it could be this, you're going to refer them for further testing and or you're going to refer them to a referral specialist to help you, especially if the problem could be quite severe. I had a patient recently uh, with cancer metastasized to spread to the spine, and there was some evidence there may have been a crushed spinal cord, whereas in this case, I would have had to get a neurosurgeon involved to take the patient to the operating room, possibly take them to the OR to do a spinal decompression procedure to get that broken bone off the spinal cord, for example. Want to do one more? Sure, yes. Uh, okay, so the next one would be, uh, in regards to ordering tests, what are your thoughts on practicing defensive medicine? Brandon, you want to take that one? Yeah, um, I was actually just reading about that earlier today. So, um, you know, defensive medicine is a, a real thing. Um, I have personally been sued um, already in my young career, and it does change you a little bit, and that you, you certainly don't want to miss anything. Um, you know, you, you may spend more time at the bedside, you may ask more questions, you may get more uh, providers and colleagues involved, more consultants, you may order more tests, and then it does increase the cost of care overall. Um, it's not a benign thing on the healthcare system. Um, the cost of care does go up because the providers tend to uh, order uh, a few more tests. And the research actually shows that that doesn't really increase your diagnostic accuracy afterwards. It just makes you uh, rule out things uh, a little bit easier as well. Another example of that is, you know, I was working at a merge and care center for, you know, 30, 35, 40 years ago, and <clears throat> mommy would bring, you know, little sweet Sue in who had a sore throat, was running a low-grade temp, and uh, it, you know, I saw no pus in there and so forth, and I just said, you know, this is a viral thing most likely. It just needs some Tylenol, some fluids, and some rest, and I anticipate that she'll get better in a day or two. Well, Dr. Fowler, she needs an antibiotic. My next door neighbor told me that she needs an antibiotic. And here is mom coming in to my clinic, paying, you know, $75 cash money on the barrel head, demanding an antibiotic. Well, what has happened uh, in, since 1928, when Al uh, Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, 100, what is that, I'm sorry, 92 years ago, is the fact that we have developed astounding resistance of, of, of bacteria to, uh, to antibiotics because they've been so overly prescribed, including, the, including giving them to animals, antibiotics to animals. I think 40% of antibiotics are given to animals in this nation um, to be able to protect the food uh, supply. And so, uh, and so we have all these resistant organisms and you feel strongly that the girl does, really doesn't need that antibiotic. But you know that the mother may be angry and if they're on the very off chance that the girl doesn't do well, that somehow, as Brandon mentioned, that you know, could something legal come out of that? It's a sad thing about defensive medicine. Different parts of the country are different. I like working in Texas because we have what's called tort limitation, T-O-R-T, which is personal injury. And, um, and I like working at the university for the same reason. One last question. Sure. Uh, the next one is actually a longer question. Uh, it is uh, from a student with a personal experience. So they said, I previously shadowed a neuroradiologist who was around your age who told me that he initially wanted to be a family physician, but was stigmatized and bullied for wanting that path and a quest to radiology. Is there still that stigma around family medicine in the present day? Uh, and are there current stigmas around any other kinds of specializations? And then you start with that. Did you hear the question? Yeah, um, I would say that I, I do believe that stigma still exists and it is 
highly inappropriate. Um, you know, medical schools, if you think about kind of the, the hierarchy of the students at the top of the class down at the, the bottom of the class, um, maybe not so much now since there's not as many grades as uh, when I graduated just a few years ago, but you know, the ones that graduate at the top of the class and make the best step one scores go into the more competitive specialties. Uh, the ones that don't go into the less competitive specialties of which family medicine, internal medicine, peds tend to be one of the leer, lower uh, competitive uh, specialties. And therefore, people think that it is just always the um, kind of the bottom class that, that goes into those specialties. When you get out and you're actually practicing, you realize that, um, you know, people like ER docs, family medicine docs, the ones that see everything um, and all comers are actually kind of the, the heroes of medicine. Um, you know, I, my brother, he's an ophthalmologist and, and I love him and he's really good at what he does, but I could not just stare at one body part all day long, like an eyeball, especially because they're gross, but that's what he does. <laughs> so, family medicine docs in the ER, we love our family medicine docs. We try to get more patients to family medicine docs uh, to establish a primary care provider. Um, they are highly, highly valued, and it is, it's an inappropriate stigma, but it is still there, and uh, we all do our part to try to reverse that. Um, I would say this. I, you remember I said the difference between a generalist and the specialist is in the rigor of the application of a differential diagnosis. You can be as good a doc as you ever want to be. You can be a family medicine doc and be razor sharp. You can com <clears throat> complete a different, excuse me, <clears throat> you can complete a differential diagnosis with the best of them, but you have to hold yourself accountable. One of the finest physicians I know is Dr. Dan Septum. He's on the admissions committee with me, and he is a family medicine doc at UT Southwestern, and he is razor sharp, and they have a very competitive residency there. So, you know, I think the proof is in the pudding. <clears throat> the completion of a differential diagnosis and the humanity that you show others, that's what matters. And that's what, at the end of the day, makes a difference with patients, with your applied science, and to partner with them for healthcare. Mm -hmm. Brandon, thanks for sitting in. Cheyenne, thanks for hosting. I want to thank all 300 of you still online for a great session. And good night. And please, uh, Brandon, any closing comments? Thanks from you. And then Cheyenne, any closing comments from you? Uh, no, I just put my uh, my email and Twitter handle in there uh, in the comments for you. If you guys have any more questions, just feel free to uh, to reach out to me. I'm obviously always available electronically. And when COVID's over, y'all can come shadow us in the ER. Absolutely. And um, <clears throat> you will have contacts through the website to try to arrange shadowing experiences. <clears throat> we, uh, Reagan Rosenberger came with us in part so that we could try to create a shadowing network to get people into the clinical environment and to increase the size of the base of physicians who are willing and uh, inviting um, um, uh, pre-med students um, who want to do shadowing experiences with us. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll call it a night and, uh, and I'm going to let, um, uh, Mariam and Rachel tell me how to stop this recording so I don't mess it up. <laughs>